Okay, everybody can hear me now. Um, so I guess um, for those of you who don't know me or don't know of me, um, I am a veterinarian who has been in practice for 32 years now. I realized that a few days ago. And uh, for the last probably 15 years, I do mostly sheep and goat work. I still do a little bit of cattle work. And then obviously the focus on the reproductive um, aspect, OC flock management, of course, we do AI and embryo transfer and own a semen facility. So I will definitely say that um, some of this presentation will be biased, uh, certainly by my experience as a vet over the last 30 some years and what I've seen that works and doesn't work and some of the things that we perhaps think should be the norm and common sense, but aren't always. Um, and I guess the other thing too is that um, as both a veterinarian who runs a reproductive facility, so I tend to see hopefully um, the, the cream of the crop and the best of the best, but that again, not always the case. Um, I've also been a sheep breeder um, since 1992. Um, I'm a little bit of an oddball. I raise Katahdins, so I have, I was one of the first people to bring them into Canada and I've had them ever since. So although they're obviously not the main focus of my income, I've certainly got some experience in the whole selection process of actually owning and raising sheep myself and some of the challenges and some of where um, the industry has come with the resources we have available to us from the time that I graduated in 1990 until now. So I've divided this presentation into two sections. Um, hopefully each section will be about 45 minutes and then we'll have about a 15 minute break in the middle. People can ask questions. They can go to the bathroom, get a drink of water, whatever you need to do. But hopefully I've sort of made the break in a logical place um, so that it, it kind of makes sense as we go through this. And um, some of it is not going to be new or fantastic or exciting, but it's certainly going to be my experience and, and my opinion, for want of a better description, on, um, on some of the key things that I see that either are or aren't being done and are working or not working. And some of the things that People need to keep in mind with all the new technology and the new computers and programs that we have, um, they're not the answer to all your all that ails you, that's for sure. All right, so we get started here. So when I think of selection for breeding stock, these are the things I think of. The first thing is why. Why do you need to select? Why can't you just go, well, I had 12 ewe lambs born in my little flock and they're female, so that's what we're gonna have. We also have the who, the when, and the where. That's usually a little bit more obvious, um, you know? And then we also have the what. So what are we selecting for? If you're gonna start making breeding decisions, what are you, what's your end goal? Um, if you don't know where you wanna be, then it's hard to make the decisions to get there. Um, and then the how is sort of the, core of the presentation is how do we get from where we are to where we'd like to be. So first off the why, I was trying to figure some picture that would reinforce this. So this is what I found. So we all wish to have a Lamborghini, but if we make poor decisions along the way or no decisions at all, we might end up driving a gremlin. And there's probably quite a lot of people here on this call that are actually old enough to remember what a gremlin is, but it is possibly the ugliest car ever built by man. Um, so to me, that's the why. Most people's why is because they want to at least sustain, if not improve on what they have. And so otherwise, why bother? Um, and there's certainly, there's a market of small producers out there now that, um, have small ruminants, you know, sheep and goats as more of a bit of a hobby or more of sort of a little bit of a homesteading type of uh, lifestyle. Um, and I, my personal belief is from what I see in that is most of those people um, should be buying their animals as opposed to trying to select for breeding stock because often they just don't have the numbers or the, the ability to, to critically evaluate the animals. Um, on a, on a numbers basis, if you only have three to choose from, it's a bit of an all or none, as opposed to you've got 30 animals to choose from to pick three really good ones. Um, so that's, that's the why, and you know everybody can figure out their own why in the equation. 
So the who, the when, and the where. So the who usually would be the producer, um, you know, at the ground level, at the farm, looking at the animals, doing the records, using whatever performance data and programs that they might, um, might have available to them. But we also need to remember that sometimes the who is the market. So, a, you know, a, a commercial lamb producer that needs to produce a certain type and size and carcass of lamb, he's being influenced by that. So then what he's looking for in a breeding animal might be quite different than the person whose influence is, I have a petting zoo and I want my sheep to be very attractive or very quiet, or I have a dairy. So, you know, my sheep don't have to have huge carcasses, but my sheep need to milk really well. And so sometimes the who may actually be the end user of whatever product you're producing. Um, and so that influences your, your selection process. But the, usually the on the ground is, you know, the people out there actually looking at the animals. Um, the when, that can be a variety of times, right? Selection can be done uh, oftentimes at weaning time. Sometimes the first lot round of selection will happen because we don't want to feed more animals for longer than we need to. Um, so we are, we're going to make a, a first selection and sell. And then perhaps again in breeding time then we might look at them again. Um, and the where, typically on the farm, but sometimes, and I do some more, I do quite a lot of reproductive work in the UK over the years, and in the fall, I'm there for a couple months. Often the where in some of those is based on the show ring. So I put that picture in there uh, because almost everything I do in the UK financially is driven by the show world and has almost nothing to do with actual production parameters. Um, so we shouldn't, undervalue that. It may not be what we choose as our traits, but looking pretty and doing well in the show ring is a criteria for a portion of the industry. So then there's the what. And I put some question marks and a whole bunch of things. So it's like, what do we want? What are we selecting for? What makes a good breeding animal? What makes a poor breeding animal? So I threw some things out there that I think about. Confirmation. Milk production, parasite resistance is becoming a big deal now. If you're a wool breed person, then obviously the wool quality is, a, is important. If you're a cotton breeder, wool doesn't even factor into the equation. People are looking for lower maintenance animals. Will they produce more lambs or better lambs with less inputs? Um, do they manage intensively versus pasture ad adaptation? Carcass quality, huge portion of North America, lambs are raised for meat. And so carcass quality is really important. But maternal traits are important because if your lambs die and never make it to slaughterhouse. So what I usually run into with new people is they've just got this massive, I don't even know where to start. Like there's so many things to choose from. What do I choose from? Because all of these things, whether you realize it or not, all of these things are interconnected. They're all part of the, the genetic makeup and the ability of that animal to exhibit those traits. And so as soon as we start selecting in a certain direction for one trait or another, you are, even if you don't realize it, impacting the other traits, either positively or negatively. And we'll talk a little bit about that when we talk um, in the second part about selecting for production parameters um, versus uh, the first part where we're going to talk a little bit more about confirmation. And so if you select very heavily for one thing in a certain direction, um, you could lose other things that are important. The example I would use that's very close to home is when the Katahdins first became a recognized breed in Canada. People were absolutely tunnel visioned about their ability to shed. So everybody selected for these sheep that shed completely and had like a double haired dog coat in the winter, never got any wool on them. And over the course of about a decade, what happened is the Katahdin sheep, which in the US is actually quite a substantial sheep and contributes heavily to the meat industry, in Canada became something that looked like a dainty coat because they focused so hard on one trait, they'd forgotten about the other traits. So that's always something we have to keep in mind when we're selecting 
is if you select very strongly in one direction, you are going to affect other things and you may not realize it right away. And sometimes you may not realize it until it's too late. Um, and the Katahdins have had to come back a long way from that. And it didn't help them gain any respect as a meat producing breed either at the time. Okay, so to me, there's two main areas of selection when you're looking at breeding stock. One is confirmation. This is what that, this is what your sheep is. Physically, structurally, this is what your sheep is. Um, and I believe that confirmation, good confirmation um, is consistent across breeds. Really doesn't matter what you're raising your sheep for, what, you know, what, what is their end product? Every sheep needs to have the ability to eat, enough size and capacity to process the food, have babies, walk around on good feet and legs. Like a, totally across the breeds, I think confirmation is something that is consistent. Let me just let this person in, there we go. Um, and then the other are production traits. So these are, what does your sheep do? And obviously these are gonna be highly variable. And East Frisian's primary job in the universe is to produce milk, they're a dairy sheep. So, their wool may not matter. They may not produce the greatest carcass traits on their lambs, but that's not their goal. Um, you know, they're the whole scene of the sheep industry. Their, their production traits are focused around milk production, whereas a Suffolk is focused more around meat traits because that's what that sheep does. And so those, obviously, those production traits are going to be more breed specific and people are going to have to figure out within their breed um, what they're selecting for as far as those traits. I'd be the last person on earth to say that I could select a good fleeced sheep from a poor fleeced sheep. Like I just know nothing about touching wool and knowing how good it is. But if you talk to the people in Australia who raise merinos, they can tell you by the feel of the skin whether or not these merinos are going to raise the quality of wool that they need. So those, those are the two main areas. And this I'm going to focus on confirmation in the first part and production traits in the second part. Um, and so the confirmation is probably going to get a little bit more emphasis because I think it is so important and it's sometimes overlooked. And all sheep need good confirmation if they're going to go on as breeding stock and they're going to pass those traits along. Okay. The computer doesn't want to let it change pages. What the heck is it doing? Uh-oh. Uh, just give me a sec here. I might just have to restart it. It seems like it got itself stuck. Oh, don't you dare. Oh, there we go. Yay. Okay, so um, for the confirmation section, um, I'm going to use as a basis for this and as a very good reference. It's a little bit older. It was done a while ago. Um, but this guide to breeding stock selection that was done with Canadian Sheep Breeders Association and CPOC in Quebec. Um, and I think, although it's, again, a little bit older, some of the pictures um, and the, the diagrams and the photographs they have in it showing some of the confirmational problems and good and bad confirmation um, in sheep and what to look for and their process of, is it really good? Is it acceptable or should you not choose that animal? Um, and they've actually, I've taken the slides out. I'm, I haven't used the whole book, but it comes as a, you can either get it hard copy. I still have some old hard copies. But you can also download it off their website and the little web address that's on this slide. Um, if you go to that under their print material on the Canadian Sheep Breeders, you can download this as a PDF. Um, and it has the whole thing and it's even got a little checklist you can use at the end to mark off if you're evaluating an animal or several animals. You can mark off whether they're really good, acceptable or unacceptable. And then kind of use that as a bit of a tally sheet to decide at the end whether you would keep them or cull them. Okay, so 
Again, I go back to confirmationally, every sheep has to be able to eat and they have to be able to walk. So for me, as an absolute starting criteria, teeth and feet are really, really important. If they can't eat and they can't walk around, then they don't do very well. And so the biggest thing we see um, with sheep typically is if their dental alignment is not normal. So not knowing who else on this call, for those of you who might be newer at this, maybe have never actually looked at the teeth on your sheep, sheep's lower incisors should touch on the edge of the dental pad. And it shows that in this little picture, it says it's got the little dental pad in the picture and the incisors and they should touch. They need to be able to do that because sheep are actually designed to graze. And so if you want them to actually bite the grass off, if the teeth don't touch the dental pad, if they stick out in front, then they can't bite off the grass efficiently. And I'm, it concerns me that I see a lot of production sheep now that nobody ever pays any attention to this. And I end up seeing them when they're having trouble holding weight. And it's because their dental confirmation is poor, but they've gotten away with it because they may be in a management system where they don't actually graze for very much of the year or they don't graze at all. If they're fed a, a TMR or hay and grain, they can probably get away with this poor dental confirmation. It's most affects them when they graze. So the sheep go out to grass and the people think they should gain because grass is good and they don't. And often we find that they have uh, poor dental confirmation. So this has nice little, um, nice little drawings. So if they're undershot, the lower jaw and the incisors stick out further than the nose, than the upper jaw. So this is like your bulldog face. Bulldogs would die if we didn't feed them because they're dental, they're so undershot. And so those sheep, they can eat okay. They would really struggle to graze because the sharp cutting part of the tooth is not even um, is not even hitting on the dental pad or barely on the dental pad so they can't bite off the grass. The mouth that you want is the middle picture where the teeth are actually touching onto the dental pad and you can see that even in the photograph looking at the sheep dead on so if you open their lips when you're looking at them and look at their teeth they should, the edge, outside edge, the front edge of the teeth should line up with the edge of that dental pad. And then the overshot or what the industry refers to often as parrot mouth, because if you think about how the beak of a parrot, the upper overlaps the lower, this causes a problem not just for eating, but they're, all the pressure from those teeth when they chew is put, not putting pressure on the dental pad that's designed for that, it's putting pressure on the upper palate that's behind it. So it can become quite sore and then they don't want to eat. Um, you will see a lot of experienced sheep people and I see it with show judges as well that won't actually hold the head level and look at the teeth. They will run their thumb up the front to see whether or not it slides up smoothly or whether the dental pad sticks out or the teeth stick out. Um, I think if people paid more attention we wouldn't have to do that at shows because they should never get as far as a show. Uh, but it's certainly something to look at. And I think more and more people are ignoring it. And I think we're starting to see more issues because of it, um, especially in the more commercial production world. Even if you're not you know, selling a lot of breeding stock to somebody or you're not maybe selling purebred rams, but at the very minimum, you're probably selecting replacement breeding stock for your own operation. And this is such an easy thing to not end up with an animal that's not going to eat properly. And this may not be obvious when you're selecting it weaning or six months of age, um, that it's a problem for them if you don't actually look. The defect is obvious if you look for it, but it may take longer and you've got more invested in them before you actually realize that there's a problem. Okay, so as we move back on the sheep, um, this is, they call it the shoulder. Um, and again, this, this I'm, and I'm not saying I'm the be all and end all of, you know, judging sheep confirmation, but certainly you have to consider that they need enough width to the shoulder that they actually can carry some body. And it doesn't really matter whether, what their purpose is, whether they're a meat sheep or a dairy sheep, um, 
They need to be able to have enough width to the front end so that the rib cage is wide enough that they can carry one enough lung capacity to breathe well and manage. And also the rumen comes quite far forward. Most people don't realize how far forward. Um, at the front peak of the rumen, it's well within the, the round, the bow of the rib cage. And so if they don't have enough room there, then it's difficult for them to take in enough food to actually perform whatever trait you want, whether that's growing wool or a prolific sheep that's carrying triplets or a, a ram that's gonna produce you know, heavy slaughter lambs. All of those things, all of those production things require food. And so they can't take in enough food. They're not gonna perform even um, you know, potentially to the management system they're in because they literally just are not being able to take in enough food and have enough space for that rumen, to, for the rest of their body to do the job that it's meant to do. Um, I never really truly understood this concept because they talk about it in the dairy world all the time. It's called capacity. They call about the capacity of these dairy cows or the capacity of dairy goats. And I never really understood it until I spent time in Southeast Asia with a gentleman from Ontario who's been a long time dairy producer, both in goats and in cattle. And that's what he's explaining to me. He said, they don't have that width through the shoulder and the chest they can't take in enough food to perform well. And so that's, that's what we're talking about through the shoulder. Um, and if you look in the second set of pictures, um, then what you're also looking for is that if the shoulder itself is very prominent or, there's, or they've got a bit of a, a sway where they dip at the shoulder, again, confirmationally in the long term, those animals aren't going to hold up. Okay, so then the capacity, so they're talking about the girth or sort of the depth and the width of the chest. Um, I think for most people, if you just looked at the sheep on the left and the sheep on the extreme right, it's sort of the one on the, the left is just more eye appealing. You think, oh yeah, there's a nice full body. The other one looks a little narrow. Um, in the sheep world, we call that goat-like, but the goat people don't appreciate that. And so, again, it's a it's do they have enough body to do the job they need to do? Um, and then they show you again the girth across the front. You need enough chest. If you have a very narrow, pointy chest, they don't have that capacity. Their legs are close together. They're they're just not going to cope well. And you get into very hot climates and they tell you that that lung capacity and the ability to pant because sheep pant, they don't sweat, um, actually becomes really quite critical to them when you get into some of these um, tropical climates. That would be, I believe, Southern Ontario at the moment, I'm told. Okay, onward down the legs to the feet. So now we put a body on this sheep. This is probably one of the most common places that I see conformational problems that the people either don't recognize them or they have a ton of excuses why they are like that. And rather than admitting it's actually poor confirmation. So one of the things is the strength through the pastern and the strength of the fetlock. So you're talking about when a sheep is standing there with their little hoof on the ground, that first joint, um, which would actually be like our knuckles because they stand on the end of their toes, they should stand like in the picture where you want them quite upright. If you see those heels squatting down towards the ground, that's a sign of very poor conformation through that pastern area. In horses, they refer to it as dropped pasterns. I think that's a suitable description in a sheep as well to have a dropped pastern. And over time, those joints will not stand up because the ligaments and everything, their, their leg is not meant to, every time they put weight on it, drop that pastern down towards the ground. And so over time, they're gonna, the ligaments will get stretched and they're gonna get, end up arthritic and they're not gonna be able to get around and eat. 
Now, sometimes you will see this later in life, especially in animals who are, I would say, not so much heavy as in they're a heavier muscle breed, but animals that are chronically overweight or obese. You can see this through life as they just packing all that extra weight, the joints start to break down. But I still think that 95% of the ones I see probably had that poor confirmation from the time that they were lambs. And it was just never selected against. Okay, so the other thing here is they're, they're showing you also um, this dropped pastern. So if you look in the picture to the right, that pastern almost looks like it has an S bend when you come from the hoof to the leg, they don't line up in a nice angle. And that is the poor conformation. And over time, those heels will drop closer and closer to the ground because they tend to wear. Whereas if you look at the center picture, it forms a nice line or a little bit of a slight angulation, but all the joints and the bones are all in a nice alignment. And I will say that I see this problem probably more in hind legs than front legs, um, but sheep carry about 65% of their body weight on their front legs. So over time, their front legs have to do a lot more work. So it's pretty important to them. Um, I have heard all kinds of excuses. I have people who say, oh, we trimmed them too short or we trimmed them, didn't trim them enough. You know, they, they say, oh, the toes are long. And so that's what's making the drop pastern. The toes might be long for whatever reasons, um, maybe because of the drop pastern or maybe just the environment they're in and they just have long toenails, but the toenail, long, long feet, um, short of maybe an animal cruelty type case do not make drop, dropped pasterns. The drop pasterns were always there. Um, the bottom uh, two pictures with the twisted legs and the splay foot, I would hope that for most people, that those would be fairly obvious. If you're standing there looking at an animal and the legs don't line up and one kind of you know twists outward or they tend to look like they go a little east-west, um, your gut's probably right about that. It's probably not the ground they're standing on. It probably is real. Um, and again, I don't believe that bad foot trimming causes these problems. I think these problems are there. Um, I think poor foot trimming for the sheep, it can be uncomfortable and sometimes can cause other issues. But I don't think that they result in these. I think these are confirmational problems that existed all along that get blamed on bad or lack of foot trimming. Okay, so then moving up the leg, looking at how the leg should be attached to the body and what they should look like. So if you have an animal who has a decent sized chest, um, has some capacity, doesn't have a little pointy narrow chest, they should look like the sheep on the left. The legs should be parallel to one another and go straight to the ground. Now, where those legs come down relative to the roundness of the body will depend a little bit on the breed. If you get a breed like a Rito, which tends to have a longer, um, narrower type of body because they're not as muscled, um, then you'll find that you don't see much bulging out above the, the top of the elbow um, because the, the chest is not as round. If you have a very heavily muscled animal like a Beltex, then it looks like a soup can if the legs come out the bottom, straight out the bottom of the soup can. And that's just be, that's not because their skeletons put together differently. It's because they have that much more muscle over their shoulder. Um, if you notice the, um, they call it narrow at the knees, it'd be knock kneed. Um, again, for whatever reasons those happen, I mean, we certainly do see lambs that, that turn out like this. Um, and I have people who will call me, especially if they only have a few and they're pets. You know, what do we do as a nutritional? You know, we're giving them 8,000 injections. And I think typically it's not. Um, if you had a group of 30 ewe lambs that all looked like this, then maybe we have rickets. Maybe we've got a calcium issue or a vitamin A deficiency or something. But the individual animals, um, they're just like individual people. They just have poor like confirmation.
And then the one on the right, um, it's a little, this, it looks like it's probably a suffix with those legs. Um, just we know which picture we're on. It's not so much that the legs themselves are not in the right place, but if you look, the knees do not line up with the feet and the elbow. They, they bow out ever so slightly. And animals that start to bow a bit as a lamb, they're going to get worse. And again, not a trait that you wish to pass along. And then the bottom pictures, the twisted legs and the splay-footed legs. Again, I would hope that those would be blatantly obvious, um, not only to see them, but to understand why you do not want those as breeding stock. Whatever's going on there, again, they, it gets blamed on nutrition and lamb management and environment and a hundred other things. And it's like, just call them. I have seen one or two bad rams destroy the confirmation in a flock in two, seat, two breeding seasons and have them take 15 years to work their way back out of it. So it's just, um, you know, I guess, and especially if you look at the male female thing, um, you know, if a female's got a bit of a problem and passes it on, that's a few lambs. If a male's got a problem and passes it on, that could be your entire lamb crop for that year that could be affected. And then potentially your breeding stock if you're keeping your own females. I occasionally see these ones they consider major defects um, only because they are pets and they belong to somebody and they want to know if we can fix them. Um, I would certainly hope those would not require any thought process to go into the cull pen. Okay, moving to the back legs. So again, what we're looking for is from the point of the hip down through they call it the knee. Let's not do that. Um, anatomically, <laughs> the stifle is the equivalent to the knee. The hawk is the equivalent to a human ankle. So you're looking for a straight line from the hip down through the hawk, down through the center of the foot. That's where you want those legs to line up. Now, what I have typically found is that once you start getting into the heavily muscled breeds, Charlays, Ile de France, Texels, Bell Texas, those breeds, um, a lot of them I find are narrow at the foot. They, they come down through the hip, down through the hock, but their feet are kind of tucked in underneath them a little bit. I think that's fine. It's because they have a very muscled, rounded hindquarters. Um, and I think sometimes due to the, the level of muscling, they just don't stand with their legs, their feet as far apart as a sheep that isn't that muscled. Um, where I think it becomes a problem is if they're so narrow that it affects how they stand and walk and they tend to roll out onto the sides of their feet. So for those people raising those heavily muscled breeds, I think it behooves you to be sort of hypercritical. I will tell you that the Dorpers, that came into Canada back in the 90s, had some of the worst feet we have ever seen on a sheep, but because they were so expensive, um, by the time they put the embryos in and got them on the ground, that everything was kept for breeding stock. And they have spent decades trying to get good feet back on that breed in North America. They have excellent feet on that breed in Australia because they ate the ones with the bad feet way at the beginning rather than using them for breeding. So like I say, in the heavily muscled ones, if it seems like the feet are a little closer together, but there's still a good straight line down, I'm fine with that. Um, cow hocked, the narrow at the hocks one is often referred to as cow hocked, which is not really fair because most good cows should not have their hocks tucked in like that either. <laughs> um, but they are basically, they're narrow at the hocks. They would be normal in the foot position if the hocks weren't tucked in so far. And then the opposite would be if they're bowed out. So this is the other thing that I tend to see that the heavily muscled breeds um, don't accept as a conformational problem. They say, oh, they, it's just because their butts are so big. It's because they've got so much muscle. Is their legs actually slightly bow out? And then when they go to stand on their feet, 
they don't bear their weight evenly on both toes. They bear more weight on the outside toe than they do on the inside toe, which means they kind of walk like, walk like people who walk and roll out on their ankles when they walk because their ankles are weak. So that's what these sheep look like. And usually the cardinal rule to finding these and recognizing them is if their feet start to get a little bit too long, the outside toe will be short and the inside toe will be long. And that's because they're bearing enough weight on the outside toe to wear the toenail off and they're not bearing hardly any weight on the inside toe. And again, I've heard all of it. They weren't trimmed properly. They weren't trimmed often enough. It's because they've got so much meat on their butts. When it really comes right down to it, they have either their back legs are bowed out or they have weak ankles and they roll out on the ankles. It's a conformational issue. And I think because there's been so many excuses in the heavily muscled breeds, um, people haven't selected against it. And so we consistently, Texels, Bell Texas, Ile de France, a lot of them as a breed have this, a bit of this weakness. And I think it's just a selection process to, to improve them. And it's not just here where the where those breeds came from originally didn't do good enough selection and let them get away with bad feet. Um, the bone quality to me is just for your breed. Do they have a, enough thickness of bone and leg to, to structurally hold them up? Right. And again, that was my comment with the Katahdins when they selected so hard for shedding. They forgot about the sheep and they ended up with these little dainty boned goat like creatures. And that's fine. Goats are light and very good on their feet and they can do that. But if you're a 240 pound, you know, Suffolk, you better have enough bone to hold that up. So it needs to be proportionate to the type of sheep. If you're a little black Welsh mountain sheep, then your legs are going to be finer because you only weigh 100 pounds. Okay, so hind feet and legs. So again, pasterns always, always look at the area from the hoof up to that first joint. Because if they're going to have a weakness where it's going to drop um, in the pastern or it's going to roll outward, often the indication to me, the first thing I'll notice is if they've got either long feet or ab the toes are not long at the same level that was that was horrendous english um the toes are unequal in the amount they're overgrown the, the actual nail and that is generally an indicator that they are not bearing weight evenly on their feet um, if you think about uh people if you need a good analogy people who walk and balance evenly on their feet um, you can tell that when you look, there's even wear on the bottom of their shoes. People who are knock kneed and their ankles tend to roll in, those people tend to wear the inside of their shoes off before the outside of their shoes and vice versa. People whose ankles roll out or if they're a bit bow-legged, they wear out the outside of their shoes. Well, sheep have two toenails. So I've seen sheep with toenails that are horrendously long, but they're both the same amount long. And so that tells me their feet need trimming, but they're walking appropriately on the foot, square on the foot. Now they may have dropped pasterns, which is why their toes are getting long because they're putting more weight on the back of the foot than they are on the front. But if there's one long one and one short one, the short one, they're bearing more weight on the short one than the long one. And so that's, you know, look for those things. If you see those, and especially if it's not a whole group, if it's one or two animals in a group, that's a clue. Um, and I think you definitely don't want to be, uh, be passing that along. Bad feet and legs can take a lifetime to get rid of in a, in a flock or in a herd. Hey, I hadn't in this particular one, because I don't have video, it, they go, they do talk in the book a little bit then about watching them move and making sure they have a normal gait. So I think that's sort of fairly obvious. If you watch enough sheep move, you know, solely just moving around, you should know how a sheep should walk. And if it seems like they're off, they could have a lame, they obviously could have a medical lameness, but they may have what appears to be a lameness or an abnormal gait because they've got a conformational problem. 
So I think it's always good, especially if you look at an animal and think, hmm, that seems a little bit off. Like it just doesn't seem quite what I'd like to see. Move them around because if they move a little bit off too, two strikes out of three to go down the road. Um, length of animal, obviously in the meat industry, <laughs> This is where your chops come from. So you don't want some little squatty round animal. You want some length of back. Um, but I think even in the other breeds, you know, in East Frisians of dairy sheep, they still need enough length again. So they have that capacity so they can fill that rumen so that they can produce milk. Or a Romanoff who's gonna carry triplets or quads, she needs enough length to fit a rumen and a pregnant uterus in there and not get pregnancy toxemia. So, you know, length and then depth, right? Should be a nice rectangle. You don't want them too short and you don't want them too narrow. Um, I should have got a picture because I think the club lambs in the US are the most appalling group of sheep for this. Um, they are tall as a horse, tallest sheep I've ever AI'd. Um, they're probably, instead of sort of being 50% body, 50% air and leg, they're probably 25% body and 75% leg. And they are long, but they're also very narrow. If you look at them from behind, they're, they're very narrow. And that's because they have selected a show type that is desirable at the current time. From a production standpoint, maybe not such a good thing. All right, and then if we also look at the top of the back, um, you want something that's nice and long and straight. You don't want them hunchbacked. Often to me, if they're hunched, especially in when you're selecting lambs, um, is that conformational? Is it, have they had some sort of back injury? Either way, I don't think long-term that that is going to be structurally uh, support them properly. Once you start putting at the weight, and especially in females, you start putting pregnancy on there. Um, the other thing is we don't want to see swaybacks. For many years, the Romanoffs were criticized for being sway back right from the time they were ewe lambs. And a few breeders um, worked very hard to get a better looking Romanoff to have that nice straight back. Yes, maybe after seven or eight years and you know 20 lambs or 30 lambs, they start to sway because of that. But I think, again, it's one of those things that were sometimes not critical enough. And if you have a breed that grows any significant amount of wool, that can be very hard to evaluate when they're not shorn because the wool will hide a multitude of sins. Most of this evaluation is best done in lambs before they're very woolly or in a little bit older sheep once they've been shorn. The Swiss Valley black noses have so much wool by the time they're four months old that you, don't, you wouldn't even know what their skeleton looks like under there. Um, because they're, they, they grow an enormous amount of wool and it hides all the sins of the world. Okay, and then the rump, obviously, again, you want, you want some strength in the back end. If they're really slopy in the back end, um, one that can end up with some hind limb breakdown issues over time because it tends to put their back legs too far underneath them. Um, and also, you can see some issues um, with both breeding and lambing ease if they're very sloped in the hindquarters. You want them to be a little more level. And that's starting to get down to kind of the, the subtleties of it for sure. Okay. Moving on to, I have some little bit better information on the scrotal stuff, but once we get into the males, I think part of your conformational evaluation needs to at least involve testicles. You would not want to know the number of times that I am semen testing rams, that I get paid to cull rams for people that have tiny or only one testicle that they didn't even know that until they hit the shoot for me to semen test. I'm like, well, there's no point in doing him. He's only got one testicle. So this is part, to me, this is part of confirmation from the producer standpoint. Obviously, the full semen evaluation requires working with your veterinarian, but you guys can do this yourselves. And I think 
it's becoming more important. You know, Rams are getting to be worth the money they really should be worth. And uh, obviously, scrotal circumference and, and normal testicles is part of that. So um, why would we do this? And scrotal circumference and semen evaluation is not nearly as common in sheep and goats as it is in cattle. But when I graduated in 1990, it wasn't that common in cattle either. It was still kind of an unknown entity. And uh, now I cannot imagine, there's hardly a person out there who would buy a bull that hasn't been semen evaluated. And whether you choose to do full semen evaluation on rams or not, um, because I will tell you in my experience, rams have generally better concentration, motility, and less sperm defects as a rule, as a, a species than cattle do. Um, but scrotal circumference is something that producers can do. And I think it's really important. So this comes from cattle, but the, the general uh, belief in the scientific world is that ruminants are ruminants. So these parameters would apply to sheep and goats as well, is that scrotal circumference is a predictor of fertility, not only in the animals, not only in the ram with this, with the appropriate scrotal circumference, but also in that ram's offspring. So if you're looking to maximize reproduction, both in the short term, you want that ram to go out and do his job, but in the long term, in his sons and daughters, scrotal circumference matters. And here in big red for every bait, because this is, nobody thinks about this. They think, yeah, we're measuring them and we're doing semen tests because we want to put that ram out with 75 ewes and we want to know he'll do the job. The single most important reason for selecting larger testicle size is to select for early puberty in the daughters of those rams. And this has been proven in cattle with research. So yes, it's about the ram doing his job, but if, especially if you're keeping your own replacement females, it's about the fertility and how early on to puberty those females um, develop. In the cattle world, obviously, they want heifers to breed as yearlings and calve as two-year-olds. So if you translate that into sheep, that would mean we would want to actually breed ewe lambs, not 18-month-old yearlings. And in order to do that, we have to do some work to do that. Um, scrotal circumference is a more accurate predictor of the age of onset of puberty than age, weight, or whatever breed it is. So Four-month-old ram lambs with big testicles are going to hit puberty sooner, and their daughters are going to hit puberty sooner than a ram that has little bitty testicles. And I certainly can tell you from the standpoint of somebody who runs a semen collection facility and who semen tests a lot of rams, that even the behavior and the, the not so much the smell in sheep, but they do have Rams do have kind of a musty smell when they're um, when they hit puberty. The test I can almost guess the testicle size often by the the behavior. You know, if somebody says to me, "Yeah, you know, this ram with the others in the group, like he just he doesn't seem as keen," they almost always have little testicles. And the other thing they know is that so in cattle, of course, yearlings we semen test yearlings. That's usually when we start because um, they wouldn't be breeding at six months of age. We hope not. So this would apply to ram lambs. If they have undersized testicles as ram lambs, they're still gonna have undersized testicles as year and a half old rams or year, like long yearlings the following season. They, they, will, they do not catch up in between. So don't waste your time and money feeding the tiny testicle boys um, because they're not going to suddenly become, suddenly become amazing two-year-olds or you know, long yearlings. Okay, so admittedly, there's a lot less published literature in small ruminants um, compared to cattle, and there's a massive amount of, of research numbers taken out of the field for cattle, especially beef cattle in Western Canada, um, because Dr. Albert Barth, who taught me reproduction when I was in vet school, that was his life's passion, was bovine semen. And so they've got scrotal circumference measurements, minimums and everything, segregated out by breed because they had veterinarians like myself who've been sending them in masses of data for decades. Um, but the general principles that will apply, ruminants are ruminant. Um, so for the producer, 
you can examine the testicles. They're right there, they're on the outside. And the epididymis, if you ever feel testicles on around, the epididymis is that little knob on the bottom of the testicle that you can feel. If you hold them and then squeeze gently and let them slide up through your hand, as they pop through your fingers, there's a little knob on the bottom. That's the epididymis. So basically what you're looking for is they should be the same size, the same shape, and the same feel, and they should be firm but not hard. Um, that's probably the hardest thing to sort of develop a feel for is, you know, squishy is obvious, but they, they should be firm, but they should not be rock hard. You should be able to put a little bit of pressure on them and they've got a little bit of give. And so then you could rule out one testicle. I've had some that have one big testicle, one small testicle. Uh, Testicles that don't hang evenly, one's held up high and one's down low, or testicles that are kind of twisted, all of those could cause breeding issues for those rams and potentially could be passed on. So you don't want to keep anything that doesn't have this nice, normal pair of testicles. Um, and again, in red, rams and bucks with large scrotal circumferences produce more semen that's better quality. That's kind of a given. We certainly see that as a collection facility. But female progeny, reach puberty earlier, have better ovulation rates and better pregnancy rates if they come from sires with larger testicles. So it's really about what you're doing for your females by having better testicled rams. Um, I do this question all the time, scrotal circumference does, does and can shift with season. If we're semen testing in May and June, which seems to be getting to be the norm because everybody's getting their ram sales are getting earlier and earlier. They can be two to three centimeters smaller than they would say be in November if you're doing them in May. If you have rams that meet the minimums in May, they should have no problem in the normal breeding season. I also find that the testicles themselves tend to feel, often feel a little bit softer when I'm doing them in May and June than when I'm doing them in the fall. And that's just a normal seasonality that we see, not necessarily something to panic about. Okay, so this is the sheet that I've developed when I do semen testing on rams. I put it on here as an example because I have also put on what is considered to be the acceptable uh, scrotal circumferences. So focus on that part, obviously, the physical soundness, eyes, teeth, feet, legs. I would hope that, you know, some of that the client would have done some calling for before I ever see them. I mark body condition. I do scrotal circumference. It's measured in centimeters. Um, and then the semen quality, obviously, you actually have to collect a semen sample. Rams can be semen tested um, with an ejaculator, just like bulls. And if the person doing them actually knows what they're doing, it's not hard on the rams and it's very quick. They often will collect in less than a minute if you know what you're doing with a good sample. So it just takes a little bit of practice. So don't be deterred. Um, I've had a few clients who've had some horrendous experiences and um, I think it's just because the people who were doing them were trying to do them like cattle and they are a little bit different, but we do them with the same machines. Um, I've also added from Dr. Barth's information, a minimum scrotal circumferences for rams based on months. So when we semen test, we usually go, are they, eight to 14 months, or are they more than 14 months? So it's basically, are they kind of a yearling or are they mature? Um, this little chart though can help you if you're trying to do some selection just based on scrotal circumference earlier in life. You know, if you've got a bunch of six month old ram lambs and you're trying to decide who's getting on the truck and who's potentially staying because they the other parameters you're looking for, they, they meet that, then, Scrotal circumferences for the little bit younger animals are on here as a reference. Um, I think that everybody should just buy a scroll tape and learn how to use it. And if you're serious about raising breeding stock, especially rams, and especially if you're selling rams to other people, take some time and learn how to measure. Um, the reliable one is excellent because it has at when you close it you can see the in the little picture there the person has their thumb on it 
you put it around, you hold the neck of the testicles, you hold them down, push on that little knob. And on the other side of the little knob, there's a little bar that pops out. When you can see the whole little green line on the little bar, you're in the right spot. These were built to make it so that everybody put the same amount of tension on. Because even vets are bad. Some of us crank them down hard. Some people don't crank them down enough. So this was try to make it more consistent. Um, you can't, I get them through WDDC, which is our drug supplier at Edmonton. Um, if anybody wants one, just let me know. I can get you one. They're $43. I can make mine last for probably five years before I wear it out. So yours would probably last a lifetime in your own block. Um, and I'm always happy to show people how to do it because I think this is a part of the selection process that you can do. And even if you just did this and didn't semen test, it would still go a long way to improve overall long-term fertility when you're selecting in your breeding stock. Um, these are just some good pictures of some of the, you know, a nice balanced scrotum. You want the scrotum to be able to hang down. When it gets hot, rams need to be able to drop those testicles to keep them cool. If they're uptight against the body and they can't drop, that can be a problem. Um, obviously too small, uneven, only one. Uh, no testicles, you can have a double cryptorchid. We do see those every now and then. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean they're sterile, just means you shouldn't use them for breeding, but you probably shouldn't be running them in the uh, feeder pen with the U lamps because they, they may still be fertile. You don't know where that other where those testicles are. And I've certainly know that one testicle rams are fully capable of breeding. But again, there's a genetic component to being cryptorchid. Don't want to pass that along. Um, this has just got some nice pictures of udders on the female side. Talks about the suspensory ligament, what sort of shape you're looking for, the teats. Again, this is something that I think not enough people actually pay attention to. And you really need to evaluate udders at lambing time. You need to evaluate the udder when there's actual milk in it and it's doing something. You cannot evaluate udders for confirmation when the ewes are dry. You can palpate them for lumps and bumps and that type of thing, but you cannot evaluate confirmation. So if anybody's using FarmWorks as their recording program, there's an actually an udder score on there. You can score them one to five, use whatever criteria, but you can definitely improve udders significantly by paying attention to that and either culling or not keeping daughters off of views that do not have good udders. Um, and for a lot of people, that includes multiple teats. So again, this just shows some nice pictures of udder placement, what you're looking for. And obviously, again, an East Frisian is going to have a larger udder than maybe a Suffolk U, but the confirmation of the shape, how it's attached, and how the teats are placed shouldn't be any different. The udder just is going to have more milk capacity. Okay, so that's the end of the first chunk. I've got, now these words of wisdom have not all come from me. I've had some clients over the years say this. The one in red at the top is mine for sure. All sheep need to be able to walk and eat. So confirmation matters. And the one at the bottom, I think everybody should buy a scrotal tape and learn how to use it. The other ones, um, I actually had a cattle client once that said, you know, the problem in the Angus breed is that just because you're born with testicles doesn't make you a breeding bull. I think I see ads, especially from small producers, advertising rams for sale that should never be breeding stock. So we just, I just think we need to be very critical on the ram side. We don't need as many rams as we need to use. Um, and then back in the day when the boar goats were huge, this had to do with bad feet, one of the biggest, most popular boar goats. Um, and we collected semen off him because somebody paid us to, not because we owned the goat. He had the worst feet. And this guy in Texas bought thousands of straws. And I saw him about five years later and he said, you know, shouldn't have done it. You guys told me he had bad feet um, because he said you can polish a turd, but it's still a turd. <laughs> and so I've always remembered that. Um, remembering that a ram will have much larger effect if he's poor than, in confirmation than a ewe because he's just going to put more offspring on the ground. 
Um, an old cattle guy told me years ago, he said, you can't change your breeding genetics program fast enough to keep up with the flavor of the week in the show world. Um, he said he had, he figures about once every 25 years, the uh, judge would have, you would have what the judge wanted to see. Um, and so you need to be true to your selection program and what you feel you're trying to produce as a breeding animal. Um, and accept that that means that Either you don't show or you're not always going to have what they want, but that doesn't necessarily mean you're wrong. The show world can be very fickle and it can change very quickly. And if you try to change your genetics to keep up with the show world, you, you literally can't do it fast enough and you'll end up with a mishmash of stuff. And I've certainly seen that with the Texels in the UK. Everybody's chasing that winning ram lamb and you see flocks that aren't flocks. They've got you know, 20 texels that all look totally different to one another because it, it's all a type that they're trying to find what's going to win in the show and not what makes a good sheep. And then I've already talked about the poor feet and legs and that not don't don't blame management often on things that are confirmational problems. All right, so that leaves us to here. Left a whole picture out. Oh, okay. Oh, it went all the way to the end. What is it doing? Okay, so we have a little break now. So people can have, I don't know, actually 10 minutes. She's gone. <laughs> I think if everybody wants to take 10 minutes and we'll start again at 7.45. I think that works, Lynn. Sorry, I was here, but my mouse wasn't moving over fast enough to unmute myself. <laughs> That's okay, and I'll try to figure out what my computer's doing, that there's a chunk of my thing missing. All right, so then you so said, I'll right, so 745 is when we'll, you'll start up again? Yep, yep, and if people have questions and or whatever, they want to, and then there'll be time for questions at the end, too, so. Ashley, my um, chat thing isn't allowing me to type questions in. It just has a bunch of J's. And when I put in there, it just keeps on hitting J all the way through. Um, mine is working and I have chat enabled for everybody. Is it your, um, your keyboard? I'm sorry, who am I speaking to? It's Cindy. Cindy. Hmm. It lets me type in. Yeah, it lets me do it too. I just did a test. Are you on a phone or a computer, Cindy? Computer. Is your mouse or your keyboard maybe stuck? Just because I don't see anybody else. And like I've just checked my parameters and everybody has permission to type. Um, my computer just doesn't want a letter. Because, yeah, participants, um, everyone is turned on to chat. Do you have a burning verbal question, Cindy? I just had a question in regards to teaser rounds. So... Mm -hmm. Um, having when you have a vet do it to kind of ensure that it has been done correctly and you aren't going to have a surprise when you put the teaser out. How can you double check when you feel the epididymis on the bottom of the testicle? What should they feel like when they're vasectomized? They'll, you won't, you can't tell by feeling. So if okay. the vet does an epididymectomy where they remove the epididymis, then that should be pretty obvious. I mean, the epididymis is gone. Right. So there, that shouldn't ever be an issue. Um, I do vasectomies and you can't because the, the part of the vas we take out is actually the part that runs up the side of the testicle. So if you're concerned at all, or just as a you know normal preventative measure, um, if, if they're semen tested, um, then basically there shouldn't be any sperm. It should just be some seminal fluid. So I'm pretty confident in mine and I've been doing them for a long time. And so I sometimes tell my clients, you know, maybe check them every two or three years because there is the odd one, depending on your technique that will recannulate. 
the two ends will grow back together. I think I take out like six or seven inches. So I don't think those two ends are ever going to find one another again. Um, and if you've got a vet that's newer, that is not super confident in them, um, I used to send mine to the lab, like I used to send the vows to make sure, but then the lab guys told me, they said, well, you know, if you take a microscope when you go to do the surgery, like if you were semen testing, when they take the vas out, if they squeeze it onto a slide and look on the slide and there's sperm there, then they took out the right thing. Okay. Because if they took out a, like a small piece of like a little blood vessel or something, there'd be no sperm in it. Okay. So and that's how, a pretty quick how, test for them how young can they be to like have it done? Like that you're gonna see semen in it on a five to six month old brown, four to five. Yeah, I, I would expect so. I've done them at eight weeks and I haven't seen any sperm. But generally by five to six months, they, there should be some sperm there. I, I mean, they should be producing sperm at that point even if they're not sort of fully in breeding mode. Okay, thank you. No problem. And are you taking new patient, new clients, Dr. Tate, or? Um, yes, in a limited fashion. <laughs> I mean, for the um, most part, like I get Eilina to help me, but on some of the stuff, like question-wise and that, but there's some stuff that she doesn't do right anymore. Well, that's because she dropped her license two years yeah. ago. <laughs> um yeah yeah on a limited basis I am yes I, I reserve the right to pick and choose let's put it that way okay and that's not so much about personalities it is about the fact that um like I leave for the UK on the 11th of August and I'll be yeah. home at Thanksgiving and then I'm just going to go like snot until January to try to get all the repro work done here and so it's more that understanding that you know I'm generally not the person's emergency vet emergency vet but something to book you to do say a semen test oh yeah i'll do semen testing and scanning and vasectomies for basically anybody who wants anyone okay yeah yeah because there's so few of us that do it um and i i've heard of a few horrific semen testing experiences with rams yes um, we had one where they threw them on the ground and held them up yeah yeah i, I mean it is nice like i i do more inville colonies rams and you know we did we did 80 rams in a day, but they also have a race well, so it holds them in with the air squeeze, which is quite nice. Um, but but the first year that I when I didn't do their sale rams, um, somebody else did, and I got there to do the herd sires, the big rams, and I'm like, what the heck's the ratchet straps for? And they were like, that's to stop the rams from coming out the top of the squeeze. And I'm like, okay. And after the first two or three rounds, they're like, oh, it was not like this at all. <laughs> so, well, that, yeah. Yeah. Well, how do I get a hold of you? Do hmm. you have a pen? Yep. My cell phone's 403 588 5897. Hasn't changed. Um, or lynn at ocflock.com. Okay. I, will I do you. tend to answer like my cell phone right now, the way it's set, you can't leave a message if you call. Oh, okay. tells you that I have it because otherwise it just gets insane. Everybody phone and say, do you know your mailbox is full? It's like, yep. Yeah. So I just have it. So you can't leave a message, but you can text it. Okay. Um, and email works fine. And when I'm in the UK, people just have to remember that I'm seven hours different. So I may not answer you when you text or something because I'm working. 
or I'm sleeping, but I tend at the end of every day to try to answer my emails, and my text messages. Okay, thank you. So that was 403-588-5897. Yep. Okay, thanks, Lynn. Yeah, it's not like it's a big secret. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I've had the same number for 15 years, so. I've got 745, Lynn. I'm not okay. sure. All right. Well, hopefully everybody's back. This is a little bit like teaching vet students when you just talk to the black hole and you hope that they're they're actually there. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope the students are there. These people are here because they want to be. The students are there because they have to be. So, okay. So the second part, we're going to talk a little bit about selection for production traits. And again, this is what the sheep produces. Like what's sort of your end product? And these are going to be highly variable. The big three would be milk, wool, and meat. Um, but obviously, the selection criteria for those things are very different when you start looking at production. I raise a breeze of sheep where wool is irrelevant. Um, milk is, I, I want ewes that are going to be able to solidly raise twins. So that matters. But then obviously, meat's the main thing that we make as the end product. Um, and then obviously there's going to be, even within those three categories, there are quite substantial differences between breeds of sheep. Um, and within the breeds, um, there's also quite a lot of difference. And I, I would go back to the segregation, especially the extreme segregation in the U.S. of what a, a show hamp or a show Suffolk or a show dorset looks like versus somebody who says, I have production dorsets. Um, you know, they don't go to shows and they're more focused on lamb production as opposed to being what the show ring wants. So even within the breed, there can be quite a variation depending on what you as an individual producer, owner of these sheep, sees as your end product and what you're selecting for. Um, and then again, often it's driven by the need to meet a market expectation on the product. So if you're a lamb producer and you're selecting breeding stock and the market wants an 80 pound lamb to go to slaughter, that's quite a different selection process potentially than if the market wants a 150 pound lamb to go to slaughter. And so that's gonna drive, you know, what the market wants at the end of the day often will drive some of your selection criteria for your breeding stock um, you know, unless you just have a hobby breed and you go, I like this one because it's purple. And so I'm going to keep it because of that. Um, you know, and then obviously within each breed, there's a certain level of selection based to a breed standard, right? So there are some breeds, let's wildly use the Swiss Valley Black Bills as an example, that have a certain black marking pattern with the ears and the face and the spots on the knees. Um, that obviously that is important too, as part of the breed standard, even if functionally or production wise, it has nothing to do with the sheep. It matters that that sheep looks like that sheep is supposed to look for the breed. Lynn, there's just a question um, that came through in the chat box, just to be aware of for when you're ready to click to the next slide. Um, it depends. I would say in the second half of August, you're in the transitional window 
So for me, it would depend a little bit on the breed of sheep and it would depend on the type of summer we're having. So if you have a breed of sheep that has quite a long uh, breeding season that say a Rito, an Ile de France, something like that, um, and you were gonna breed in August and we were having kind of a normal August that's sort of normal starting to cool off towards fall temperatures, um, you might get away with using no seeders or PMSG because the ewes may be cycling naturally on their own. Um, some people will put a teaser ram in for two weeks um, for two things. One is it will tell you if you if you see behavior from him where you put a marker harness on and you see marking, then obviously those ewes are cycling naturally. So they should breed naturally without necessarily using a seeder. Um, if you do, and if they're sort of sitting on the fence going, mm, I'm kind of, I'm undecided if I want to cycle now or cycle three weeks from now, um, often putting the teaser in there will stimulate them to start cycling a little sooner than they would naturally. So that can be a benefit if you had, I don't know, let's go for something crazy. If you had, um, Scottish black faces, they're a very seasonal breed. They like to breed in like October, November, December. If you felt the need to breed them in August for whatever reason, I think you would have to use cedars. I don't think they'd be cycling naturally. That would still be considered out of season for them. And last summer, because it was so hot and so dry, um, even some of the people using cedars in the latter part of August did not have good conception rates. So the environment of how hot August is can be a factor. Day length is a, the driving force, but if it's unseasonably hot, I think it affects use cycling and it affects semen quality as well. So that's terrible. The answer being it depends, but it really does depend on breed and kind of what kind of August are we having. Does that help? All right. Thanks, Lynn. No problem. Oop, too far. Okay, so. This is the Royal Highland Show in Scotland. This is the Texel class. Um, I just scanned this picture because it's it's a show. So basically, this group of animals is being selected strictly on confirmation. Now, maybe some of them have performance data, but in this entity of whoever's going to win, which in this case, if you win a class at the Royal Highland, that U is suddenly going to be worth a ton more money than the other U's in the class, um, then it, it's strictly on confirmation. Like that's, it's what it's about what that sheep looks like. And you can see even in this class of U's, I'm going to go out on a limb and say, these are probably actually open yearlings. They're probably what they call hoggets. Um, there's quite a difference. If you look down the line, just at the back end of these animals, don't judge the color. In the UK, they actually dip their sheep and make them yellow for shows um, because it makes everything stand out more than if they're white. But there's a few people here, obviously, who haven't dipped their sheep. Um, there's one down the line that the really dark one, to me, the back end looks almost like a Beltex. So there's still, there's a lot of variation, but that's selection on confirmation only, right? No idea if they can reproduce or raise lambs or anything else. And that drives the purebred world in the UK. The $100,000 ram might have zero production data on him, but he looked good and he won at the Royal Welsh. Okay, so if we start looking at production traits um, as part of the equation, then people are like, well, what, what type of things am I going to keep track of? And again, that's going to matter a little bit about why you're raising your sheep. So in the dairy world, the people in, with dairy sheep have a program similar to DHI in cattle, which is a recording program that records uh, you know, how much milk they produce in a day and over a lactation cycle, which in cattle is 305 days. In the sheep, it's a little bit shorter. And then it also evaluates the components of the milk, how much protein, how much fat, um, those types of things, because all of those are the things that matter for that sheep. Um, to go into making that end product of, of generally cheese products um, with sheep's milk. Um, so they're going to record those type of things. 
Now, the, the owner may also care about, you know, ewes that give birth to twins rather than singles. So they're going to keep track of those. So when we start looking at, um, you know, on the farm, just that, that first level of recording on the farm, what type of things matter to me that I might want to keep track of that I could select for? So I would say that, you know, some of the, the normal sort of starting points for most people are birth weights and weaning weights. So birth weights can vary quite a bit within breeds and they can vary from year to year. I would venture to say that in my experience, um, consistently small birth weights, lower than one would expect, say for the breed, um, is probably more of a problem than the little bit higher weights. This year has had, many of my clients have said they've seen particularly large birth weights, high birth weights on lambs, but the ewes haven't had any trouble having them. So, you know, I'm not sure why that is. That can often be a factor of nutrition and a bunch of other things. But I think if you have ewes that are putting out consistently low birth weight lambs, it might not just be about the management of the ewe. It could be about the, maybe the ram had a small birth weight. Um, and because sheep have multiples, we don't have to select the same way they do, say, for um, a heifer bull. In the cattle world, you would not put, you know, a 120 pound birth weight bull on a bunch of heifers because um, nobody likes their veterinarian that much. And so, um, you know, they have, they have lower birth weight bulls, but cows only have a single calf. With the multiples, that's less of an issue. So I think it's more that you, if your lambs kind of get smaller and smaller, then you'll maybe see smaller birth weights, then you're going to see lower weaning weights, then you're going to see them being later to puberty. And it becomes a bit of a cyclic effect where you just sort of everything sort of devolves as far as performance. Um, but birth weights are important if average daily gain matters to you. If you want to know how much they're growing, you need to know where they start. So birth weights need to be birth weights. And um, people, I think, have no excuse for actually weighing lambs. We can all hold a spring scale with a lamb sling. It's not like people who eyeball calves because they're like, well, I don't have a way to weigh something that weighs 100 pounds in the field. Um, so birth weights and then weaning weights are usually the next thing people keep track of. So, you know, there's a few reasons for that. Obviously, you want to see how much they grow between birth and weaning. Your weaning weight is generally an indicator of the job that your ewe is doing. So the amount that lamb grows between birth and weaning reflects more on its mother than on its father because that has a lot to do with her milking ability, how good a mom she is, make sure it's you know getting fed regularly, that type of thing. Then the 100 day weight, so that's the next parameter that most people would look at for lamb growth, your 100 day weight is often more than a reflection of the sire. You know, weaning to 100 days, that's the, often the influence of the sire because that's your lamb basically up to 100 days. For some breeds at 100 days, they're, they're basically, approaching slaughter weight. And so then, it, you know, that's kind of where the sire factors into that. Um, number of lambs born. That could matter if you're in a more prolific breed and your management system for what you're raising is set up to have less use that each produce more lambs. That becomes a criteria to keep track of. Um, you know, do you want a Romanoff that consistently only has a single? Like she's, she should be built to do better. Um, on the other hand, you know, maybe you don't necessarily want a Dorset that consistently has a single. Maybe in your management, you're like, I need twins. Twins is what works out and makes, pays the bills. Um, number of lambs weaned. I think this is really key on the you side of things, whether you're commercial, purebred, whatever. Um, the the ewes that are weaning the lambs they put on the ground and not just letting one or multiples of them die from neglect basically, or they don't have enough milk. So, you know, you may not know the reason that she gave birth to two and only one made it, but that may reflect on her. It may not reflect on the lamb. So I think, you know, those are the type of things to think about. Um, and then I put a note there, average daily gain, which obviously, you know, tells you how fast that lamb is growing, which is a product partly of its genetics, partly of its nutrition and its environment. Um, we can help that along with things like creep feed. The one really important thing to go down this road, and I don't know how a person could consider raising breeding stock to sell to anybody else, but even within your own herd, 
you have to have individual identification for any of this to mean anything. I, if, you, if you are running 300 ewes and you are keeping your own replacement ewe lambs and you do not ID those lambs at birth and connect them to who their mom is, then you are selecting your breeding stock strictly on confirmation because you don't actually know really anything else about them. You don't know who they're from. You don't know who their mother is. You don't know if she was a good mom or not. You're basically selecting them on what they look like at the day that you select them and, and how big they are. Because usually if you're not putting ID in their ears, you're probably not getting weights and stuff. So those people are selecting strictly on, that's a good looking ewe lamb at 12 or 16 weeks of age or whatever. Um, the challenge with that is, depending on what you're wanting to select for, almost invariably the singles are going to be those big, nice looking lambs. And that doesn't necessarily mean they're better lambs. It just means there was only one of them. Um, a twin or a triplet, um, certainly in the triplets, you know, in my Katahdin's, if I have a ewe that raises triplets and she has three nice, reasonably grown triplets at weaning versus one big single, um, those three triplets in the long run of the flock might be better breeding stock. But they may not look as good as the single because they had to share another rather than the one just having all of it. Um, so I think it's if you're if you're going to do it, individual ID at birth of some sort becomes pretty critical. Um, if, if a person doesn't want to do that, I don't see how you sort of make any other production parameters work. Um, generally speaking, just this on-farm level of recording does allow you to make decisions within your own flock. You can compare sheep in your flock and your management system with one another. Um, it's pretty basic. It's, it's kind of at this level, if you're just writing it down, keeping track of it and going, well, these were all born as twins and they had a decent, you know, they were in the top half of my weaning weight, so I'm going to keep them as you left. Um, it has the limitation it's pretty raw data. It doesn't allow for the age of the ewe or uh, how many lambs were in the litter or any of those type of things. It's, it's a pretty basic math sort of equation, but it's a start. It's a place to start. Um, and, you know, and for some people with a small group, that, that's all they need. And my suggestion is whatever criteria you're using and what you're looking at at that level is in your, your females, at least, select for something that is above the average. You know, if your average weaning weight is 50 pounds and you want to improve your weaning weights, then select replacements that were more than 50 pounds. You know, that's, that's kind of the, the really basic part. Again, the limitation is, one, you can only compare your sheep to your sheep. Um, it, it doesn't, you can't compare it to the neighbor because he may feed and manage his sheep completely differently. Um, so you can only, and you can only really compare if you lambed at different times of the year, she, lambs within a group. Um, obviously, this is maybe a little bit easier for something like a wool breed. Um, because if they're doing, you know, if they're basing it strictly on fiber quality, um, that sort of is what it is. Um, you know, they do the micron testing or whatever they want to do. And they'll say, well, this sheep produces better fleece than this sheep. Um, but when you start getting into things like muck production and lamb production, there's a lot of factors that play into that. And so this is just kind of a really basic place to start. Um, I think that if you're sort of at this level, I would hope um, without anybody being offended that you would be purchasing rams from somebody who perhaps knows a little bit more about their rams and is keeping a little bit more data on their rams. Um, if you're buying rams to try to improve, I think at this level, trying to keep either rams from within your own flock um, or certainly trying to sell rams would be harder because the accuracy of your data is just not there um, because of the sort of the basic level of your data. Um, all right. So then if you are going to keep this data and think, man, I'd like if it would just, if it would do some more things for me, if it would do adjusted weights, because every lamb is not the same number of days old when you wean them. So you can sit down manually 
or on a spreadsheet like we did for many years before all this computer stuff. And you can do a 100 day adjusted weight or a 50 day adjusted weight. So that means you have to figure out the average daily gain and then work backwards and say, okay, well, this lamb that I weighed at 39 days old would actually weigh this based on his gain if, if he was 50 days. So there's a lot of adjusting that needs to be done so that all the data, you're, you're comparing apples to apples and not apples to oranges. So now in the lovely technological computer age, we have software that does these things for you. So I am not neither a promoter of any particular software, but I have a bunch of pictures here just to make you aware there's a lot out there. So Shearwell has the FarmWorks program. There's, if you buy the Shearwell, it has sheep and cattle on it. That's just how it comes. Um, you can, you have access to both. Um, it's good for being able to record data and it will do some basic calculation stuff for you. We don't have access to dumping into a national database like they do with it in the UK. Um, Ag Sites is, um, what do they call their program? Um, they're a Canadian company out of Ontario and they do a cattle program, they do a sheep program, they do a goat program. It's all web-based, mobile version. You can you know, go out to the barn with it on your phone um, and look stuff up. Uh, Genovis, you can do recording for within your own flock. And then we'll talk in a minute about, you can also use it to, compare, to do flock comparisons. UManage is a program out of Quebec, but it is in English as well. Um, that's basically meant for managing your ewe flock and keeping track of your data. And they too can connect with Genovis. Sheep Genetics is the company that runs Lamb Plan out of Australia. Um, so the NSIP or the National Sheep Improvement Program in the United States, Lamb Plan is actually the company that does all their data run for all their genetics. So they're kind of like an equivalent to Genovis is in Canada, um, but they're based out of Australia and they do the Merino plan and they do kid plan for the goats and a bunch of other programs. Um, and then Gallagher, Gallagher has software um, for cattle and it has software for sheep where basically um, you have a mobile device or it's on your scale head and you can keep track of weights and things and then it'll do some of the basic calculations for you. So there's a lot of options out there. They range from, I think you manage is about $300 to get onto it um, up to and doesn't require any necessarily any special equipment per se, um, up to you know several thousands of dollars um, if you get into like the FarmWorks program and stuff because of the hardware that goes with it. So then, if you then decide, okay, you know maybe I want to be able to know, am I buying rams from another breeder that are actually going to be improvement in my flock? You know, do I want to go? beyond what I know about my flock and see how does my flock compare to other flocks of the same breed. Um, so then again, some of these programs allow that. So Ag Sites does it because they have an automatic link on their program to Genovis. So to compare to other Suffolk breeders in Canada that are on Genovis, you're only being compared to sheep that are in the system. Right, so it doesn't compare you to all the flocks that aren't using that system or don't wish to record at that level, but they have an automatic data dump that goes back and forth between the two. Um, Lamb Plan in Australia does the same thing. If you're a cotton breeder in the US and you join the NSIP program, then you can compare data to all the cotton breeders that are on the program because the Lamb Plan comes back and then you know, it ranks animals and it gives them EPDs. And EPDs could be like a whole weekend seminar. So I'm not going to get into all that. This is more just showing you what's out there um, to, to sort of explore if you want to notch it up the level on your criteria. Um, but you do, in order for them to be accurate, these programs, there's a few parameters that you have to consider. One is comparing your breed to your breed. So one of the challenges with a program like Genovis is if you have a I don't know, let's say you have Shropshires. So there's not a lot of Shropshires in Canada and there's maybe not hardly any Shropshires on Genovis. So in order, when they run it, your, your sheep get run through the database, through, through the program with other breeds of sheep because there's not enough in one breed to run the data all by itself. 
So that's going to skew it a little bit because the other breeds may or may not um, have sort of the same traits and purpose as your breed. Now, if you're a Suffolk breeder, you're only going to be run against Suffolks. If you're a Rito breeder, they're only going to run against Ritos because they have lots and lots and lots of that breed in the database. Um, so you do have to be careful of that as far as the accuracy of the results. If it's not all the same breed, obviously, there's you're going to have less accurate results. Um, and the other thing is for the results to have reasonable accuracy, you have to have genetic links between the flocks. So if you have a flock of XYZ sheep that you have been closed and you have not bought rams or sold rams or anything, you're just, you're like, you're an island in the industry, then the you'll get numbers back out of a system like Genovas, but the accuracy is not going to be there. You know, it might say that, you know, you have a, whatever, your, your ram should produce lambs that we net 3.5 pounds heavier than than this other ram you're comparing to. But the problem is that accuracy may only be 30% accurate, might not be 95% accurate because you have no genetic links to other flocks to see how your genetics perform under their management and how their genetics would perform under your management. So although you know genetic, the performance recording and the, these programs are meant to sort of eliminate management differences and say, okay, if you put these four rams all in the same management, even though they came from different managements, this guy should perform better than these guys. Um, that's that's what it's based on doing. That used to be the R, the old ROP program where they used to put rams into a test center, treat them all the same, and who see who did well and who didn't. Um, those are super expensive um, for biosecurity reasons. Lots of people would not want to contribute their rams into those systems. So with the advent of computer databases we have a way to sort of level the management playing field and see what's really the genetic difference and not the fact that your ram grew up on grass and my ram grew up on barley. And so, you know, their weights are different because of management to actually see. But if they're not, if the flocks don't have genetic links amongst them, um, then the accuracy goes way down. And so it's not, it's important to look at the, the your EPD values, but it's also important to look at the accuracy. Also, have to consider are they heritable traits or not? If it's a trait with a high heritability, that means it has a high chance genetically of passing to the offspring. If it's a very low heritability, then you could be the very best ram with that highest thing. But if that trait doesn't have a, a high tendency to pass on genetically, then you may not gain that just by using that animal. So, you know, they're. These programs are great. They're a tool. They add information for you. They're part of that big box of toys that you can work with and tools you can work with, but they're not the be all and end all. You know, a Genovis number is not, is not everything. And so that to me is the limitation. Um, the other thing, you know, we're very fortunate in the Katahdin breed because when the NSIP started their program, um, one of the big universities in the U.S. had a big Katahdin flock, and their geneticist is a Katahdin breeder as well. He spent decades building the formulas that are Katahdin specific. So our formulas in Lamb Plan are different for that breed than they are for the Rambolais or the Merinos or something else. But not every breeds have the benefit of them being able to build those those formulas specific to the breed. So, like I say, it's a tool, but it's not everything. So I think, you know, people need to be aware of that. Um, you know, the more people that get on it, hopefully the more the accuracies go up because there's more genetic relationships between um, the flocks. And then there's genomics. So genomics is basically where they go in and they look at the DNA of your animal and make some predictions about based on its DNA, what its performance or what traits it may or may not pass on to its offspring. So some of these genomic traits are pretty straightforward. Scraping resistance would be one of them. There are certain genes and genotypes that they know are more or less resistant than scrapie. And if your animal has a RR genotype, then those are the genes it can pass on. And so then, you know, that's 50% of the equation. It depends what the U is. And so that type of genomics is pretty straightforward. Um, they're, they're doing genomics now for resistance to Medivisma or OPP. It's not as, 
straightforward or as cut and dried. Um, but they're starting to look at it. So that may be a way in the future to select for resistance to metabesma. And then they're starting to look, and we are behind the cattle somewhat in the genomics. We're certainly behind the dairy cattle world um, in production traits. Like, you know, are there genetic markers that say that these animals are gonna have tastier lamb or grow faster or be parasite resistant? Um, all of those things potentially down the road could be possible, but right now they're in the very early stages in sheep. Um, NSIP in the US is now doing genomics on every single lamb that's in the system. Like as they're entering the system, they send the, the DNA samples in. So they're building that database of information because right now they know what the genome of sheep looks like, but they don't know which parts are important for which things. They're still learning that. Um, and they're doing research and New Zealand's doing quite a lot of it because they got a large sheep population. Um, and so I think that's down the road, it's in the future. But we have to remember that the only way that they can figure out what the genomics is telling us is all the data that goes into the, the databases that we're currently using, like Lamb Plan and Genovis. That's the data they use to figure out which genotypes do which trait. So without that information, the genotype is just DNA. And we have no idea what parts of it or you know, if this animal's got this pairing. We don't know what that does unless we have the data to go with it to go, oh yeah, and that animal grew really fast or you know, it had good marbling or whatever the trait is. It needs all those years of data, which is partly why the dairy cattle are so far ahead. Because especially in Canada, they have a hundred years of DHI data on dairy production. And so they have a ton of data to know what that DNA is doing or not doing. We don't have that yet in sheep. So while it's fun to do SNP50 tests in sheep at this point, I don't think they're actually that useful from a selection standpoint, but the day may come. So that kind of leaves us here, right? Everybody's like, now what do I do? Um, you know, it's like, I've got all these options and all this stuff and where do I go from there? So, and you know, this is, this is my approach. Um, and this is kind of how I try to point my clients at least to start with is First off, sit down and think what traits are important to me, either to the breed as a part of the breed standard or to an end product. Because even people raising commercial animals, if you're selecting for replacement ewe lambs, you're still selecting breeding stock. They're just not purebred. So what are the traits that are important to your breed or to your end product? What are you trying to make? Um, you know, if you're trying to, if you're trying to produce good carcass lambs, then does it really matter what kind of wool your sheep have on them? You just deal with it. Um, what traits do you want to improve in your flock? Right? Maybe your flock produces great lambs, but all your ewes have singles and you'd like to improve your prolificacy. Or maybe you get lots of lambs, but they don't grow very fast. So you need to, you know, to start with, what do, you, what do you want to improve within your flock? Because you can't improve everything all at once. You, you have to focus a little bit. Um, I deal internationally with a lot of people that think that just buying top end genetics from another country and sticking it into their system will solve all their problems. And the, most of their problems are nutrition and management. And so the best breeding stock fails because they can't manage it for the genetics it's capable of. New genetics or better genetics will not fix your management and your nutrition. So sometimes, your start of selecting breeding stock is fixing some of the other things so that they have a fair chance or not expecting that if you go to somebody with what you perceive as really high performance breeding stock in a specific area and you bring them to your place and then you don't feed them well appropriately, well, then they're not going to, they're not going to meet their genetic potential because you're not managing them appropriately. And then, you know, you get angry and say, well, I paid all this money for this ram and I've got these little scrunchy lambs. Well, that may not be the genetic fault of the ram. The ram might be just fine. It may be that your management is not good. Um, and then, you know, I think the next question with that is, are you just wanting to improve your own flock or do you want to be able to sell breeding stock? Because I firmly believe that if you're just wanting to improve your own flock, then, you know, obviously selecting female replacements partially, maybe buying some, buying in ram genetics, then you're looking for the traits in those other people's animals that are gonna work in your flock. If you're gonna to start to sell breeding stock, then you've gotta be, I think, a little more 
critical, especially on rams, about what you're going to sell out as breeding stock. Um, so once you kind of decide those things, then you got to step back and go, okay, so what things, what parameters do I need to measure to evaluate these traits? So if the thing you want to improve is average daily gain, well, then you need to start weighing lambs. You need to weigh them at birth, weigh them at weaning, weigh them at 100 days so that you can start to select for the ewes and their offspring that are giving you the fast growing lambs. Or you need to know that that's a trait when you go to look for a ram, that's a really important trait to you. So you may, discussing with the breeder, you know, you might be looking for a ram that had really fast growth rate. Another guy might think my growth rates are fine, but I need better carcasses. So he might be looking for something slightly different. Um, then what are the tools that are available to assist you? So both, and this is twofold. One is for if you're going to record information about your own flock to evaluate where you're at, where you, how to get where you want to go. Um, you know, we've talked about some of the software programs and stuff now that do a lot of the math for you. Um, and then the other thing is, you know, what tools can you use and learn to understand what they mean if you're talking to other people about either buying animals or if you're selling animals. Um, you know, if you're going to use EPDs as part of your selection process, then you need to spend some time to understand what they mean, um, how to use them, and what their limitations are. You know, like I said, they're not, they're not the be-all and end-all. They're part of the bigger picture. They're not the, you don't just go, well, I want a ram with an EPD of five on that trait, um, because it's, it's just not quite that simple. And then do you want to be able to compare to other flocks or are you, you know, still working within your own flock? Because obviously, if you want to be able to compare to other flocks, then you're going to have to at some point step onto a program like Genovis or Land Plan or something, because there's really no other way to do that on a performance basis, um, because your data just tells you about your sheep on your farm. Okay, so once you've decided all those things and you're like, okay, we know what our traits are, we know what we're going to evaluate, then this is the way I do it. I'm not saying it's necessarily right or wrong, but I think it works for a lot of people, is you want to determine a group of potential breeding animals, and I do it based on paper first. So I look at my lambing records, whatever, my growth rates, and it doesn't matter whether you're just doing some simple math yourself or whether it's Genovis numbers, or you're getting numbers out of your personal, you know, new plan software or whatever. Um, but the criteria that you're looking for, whether that's maternal or terminal sire, or somewhere in between or wool, and I put together a group of animals that meet the criteria on paper. So for me, males should be in the top 10 to 20%. So, you know, if, growth rate's important to you, then the parameters that grow into growth rate and, and or the EPD for growth, you know, whatever those parameters are, your males should, should be the cream of the crop. There's way more males in the world than we need to keep the sheep industry going. So the males, I would say generally 10%, but for people who are more established breeders, um, you know, especially in the purebreds, if they've been at it for a number of years and have done a fair bit of selection, they probably have a bigger group that's quite, quite exceptional um, because their whole flock has been sort of brought up to a little bit higher level. Um, but generally 10 to 20%. Half the males in the flock are generally not going to be good enough, really, I don't think, to be breeding animals um, on any given year. Females, I would say at least, you know, you want at least about average, so the top 50%. Um, some people will say, no, I only want the top 30%, or they'll take the top 10 or 15 for themselves, and then they'll sell the next 15% below that. But they've got to be at least better than average because if you select for something that's less than average in your own flock, you're going backwards. Now, they might be more than average for somebody else's flock. That's where people have to start talking about what they're looking for and where they're at. Um, and then remember that selection for a single trait will affect other traits. So here's an example is that um, if you have a terminal sire breed, say you have Shirley's, and you are doing carcass ultrasounding, and you have animals that are scoring quite high on the carcass ultrasounding, 
But you might want to say, you know what, I will take a ewe lamb, like the ram lamb, if he's got a really high carcass data and, and that's great, and he was a single, I don't care. He can still be a breeding ram. But if it's a ewe lamb, I will take one that has a slightly lower performance on the carcass part if she was born and raised as a twin by her own mother. Because the problem will be if you select for nothing but carcass, 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 you're, by selecting for that, you are inadvertently selecting against the maternal traits. And eventually you'll have big butchy ewes that either only have a lamb or they don't get pregnant easily because you've forgotten that you have to balance that. Or if you select for very maternal traits constantly, you might start to get rams that sort of lack being masculine enough to be rams. So that's why I say the criteria may be slightly different for males and females or what you feel makes them the criteria for the for being a breeding animal. So again, very carcassy, high scoring male, great. If he's a single, who cares? Female, maybe you say, nope, I'll take her a little lower, but she's got to be a twin. She's got to be raised by her own mom. Because in the long run, the fertility of your flock will be better off and you're not really compromising that much performance on the carcass side. She's still going to put good solid lambs and you can put good carcassy rams on them. So I look at all of that and then I get this group, whatever size this group is, it's going to be bigger or smaller, depending on the size of your flock, that meet all your criteria on paper. They meet the cutoff on paper. So then you've got, like I have in the picture here, a reasonably large group of sheep. Then you put those sheep in a pen and you go out and you critically evaluate confirmation in the group. Because when it comes down to it, confirmation still matters. So you could have a sheep that has the best performance data in the world, but if it has garbage for legs, it should not be breeding stock. You know, now some people will do it the other way around. Um, but I find that if you get a really nice looking animal with poor performance numbers, then it's, it's hard to cull that animal and not make them breeding stock because you've already kind of fallen in love with what they look like. So I much prefer to figure out who meets my production criteria on paper. And then if I go out there and go, man, you know, you're number one on my list on the piece of paper, but you are butt ugly. You are just not put together nicely. And that doesn't happen a lot because typically the animals that perform well are typically built properly or they wouldn't perform, but it does sometimes. Or you just go, man, I don't know how you scored like that because like you have bad feet or you're just, you're just little or you know, whatever it is. I find it's easier to take good numbers and cull an ugly sheep than it is to take a pretty sheep and cull them on bad numbers. So that's the. I do it in that order because I tend then, you know, it, it's kind of like I'd heard Kathy Parker talk a similar talk a number of years ago. And her comment was, don't ever name a sheep. Because to call something with a name is very, very, very hard. So, you know, if you're going to name it, you have to accept it might be the ugliest, poorest performing sheep, but it might be on your place for years. And so you're better off just to not name it. And I can honestly say, I don't even name my rounds. My rams are all called by whatever their ear tag number is. That is their name. Um, and partly because I'm in a breed that doesn't name their sheep anyway. We just use ear tags. But, but yeah, so that's, like I say, that's my, my philosophy is good performance that ugly is easier to get rid of than something that's pretty with bad performance. So that's the order that I do. it. All right. And there'd be the end. Everybody's brain looks like that picture with the poor girl looking at the book. Uh, we can open it up to questions from the participants. So feel free to type them into the chat box or feel free to unmute yourself and ask Lynn the question. There is a question that came in the chat box for you, Lynn. Do you use a maternal sire on a terminal U? Um, 
if if your end goal is to make crossbreds, I think that doing it the other way around might be a little bit better because it would be easier to look at the maternal traits of the Romanov. But I wouldn't say that it would be that it wouldn't necessarily work um, if you did the cross that the other way around. Um, if, if I assume the goal is to make it an F1 crossbred commercial U. And then, but then you'd still select those crossbred U's probably with a little bit more of a maternal slant, in, at least in the first generation. I, I would want to select them with more of a maternal slant than the terminal sire because it'd be really quick to see the maternal traits disappear. Any other questions? There's no need to be shy. <laughs> I would make the comment too that um, you can't select for everything all at once. If you have if you have multiple things in your flock that you wish to improve upon, um, I think you have to look at. I, I would group them the big groups into either are they maternal traits or are they terminal sire traits? Because those two things tend to work against one another. And so then sort of decide whether whether you can whether you can sort of go down two paths where you have a group that you're trying to make more maternal U type sheep out of. Um, and then the path of up the more terminal sire. Um, that's not usually a problem in the purebred. I, I'm a firm believer there's really no such thing as a multi-purpose sheep. Um, they all slant one way or the other. Um, and, and once you get into the commercial thing, I could spend a whole hour telling you how, what I feel about crossbred rams because I really don't like using crossbred rams. But I think if, if you're commercial and you're using crossbred rams that are like a Suffolk cross with a ham, say, or a Suffolk cross with a Canadian, those are both terminal breeds. Um, a Suffolk cross with a Romanoff as a ram, to me, especially if you put that on crossbred ewes, you could get a very inconsistent lamb crop because you don't know which ones are going to get more Romanoff, which ones are going to get more Suffolk, and more, which ones are going to land in the middle. So if you're going to use crossbred rams at all, which again, don't advocate, um, at least make the two breeds that are crossing both either terminal or both maternal but not a crisscross because I've seen it and you get incredibly inconsistent lambs because of such a genetic mix. I'm all about crossbred use but I still think that single breed rams make more sense. I'll do another call for questions. I'll give it a minute to see if there's any others that um, that come through. I guess I have a question, Lynn. Um, mm -hmm. One of my concerns, like bringing in, you know, starting up again and bringing in new stock is biosecurity. There's not a lot of people out there that are testing for OPP and that. Is there anything other than the blood test that when you go on to a property that you can be looking that kind of signals, warning flags for potential disease? Um, it, it can be tough. Uh, I think, so I'll, I'll answer your question and then I'll make a little bit of an announcement that maybe will be news to some people, which might be good news to some people. I think it's awesome news for the industry. Um, so I guess what I tell people is some of the things is like, look with your eyes, right? I go on to every farm that I've ever been on for the first time, assuming that they have CL and that they have Medivisna until proven otherwise. Usually evidence of CL is not that hard to find. You may not see actual abscesses, you might, like swellings. Um, but if you're up closer to the sheep, look for little bald scar spots that don't grow wool or don't grow hair, because that means they probably, they've had an abscess at some point. Usually that's a, a clue. 
Um, the other thing with MV is if they have, if they're not a highly prolific breed and they've got a lot of bottle lambs, or they complain about problems with mastitis, um, it may be mastitis, but it might be medivisna because you lambs with medivisna tend to milk well, but as they get older, their, their milk production, because the other is affected, gets worse and worse. And also look at sort of, especially, and it's hard if they're not shorn, but if you're at a farm at a time when they don't have a lot of fleece, look at general body condition. Um, if, you know, they generally look good and there's a handful of little old girls, great. But if you think if 10 or 15% of the flock looks a little on the thin side or, you know, doesn't, um, when they run off, they always kind of fall to the back, be a little bit suspicious that there's more going on. Those are some of the clues I would look for. Um, Cause yeah, it's, it's tough. And I have the testing program is not ideal either. The test is not perfect by any means. Um, it's good, but it's not perfect. So those are the things I always look at when I walk onto a farm. I just, I just want to see the sheep, how they are. And I want to see the flock. Like if I was going to buy ram from somebody, I don't want to just see the ram in a pen. I'd like to kind of see the flock, see how they're managed, see, you know, and as you chat people up, they will tell you things that they may not otherwise realize they're telling you if you listen. Um, because a lot of times people have diseases that they don't recognize it for what it is. You know, they'll say, Oh, yeah, you know, we got all those things on their necks because we've got these fence line feeders, they're built out of wood. It's like mm, you probably have caseus. Uh, you know, so I think you just you have to be a little bit smart about rather than being really direct on questions that they either may not know the answer to or they may not want to answer, to just kind of chat and see what comments come out. I find that can be very helpful. And then look around, like just see them in their normal world, you know, and and uh, and ask some questions. I, I have a neighbor that I don't do that work for. And she complained to me once. She said, oh, she says, I got these ewes. I got beautiful udders, no milk. I, I, will, I will go to my grave. She's got medivis now. I'm sure she does. And I'm sure it spreads. And but she doesn't, they don't tag their lambs at all, not till they're weaned. So they don't even know. And if lambs are robbing, it's spreading it. So you know, you those little kinds of things, you just have to have in your head what else could it be besides what they're telling you. Because they may not realize it for what it is. Or they may not want to tell you. But sometimes I think they just legitimately don't know, they don't recognize it for what it is. Um, so on the note of biosecurity, that may be helpful. It, it's not going to be the answer for everybody, but certainly I'm assuming if you're on this call and you're interested in selecting breeding stock, um, that you're you know sort of just a notch above the big commercial um, operations, you know, you're not a feedlot probably, is that we now have a fully approved domestic semen program for Canada. It got approved at the end of June. So um, the way it works is that the animals can either come to a center like ours, um, or they can be isolated on the farm where they normally live. So for the people who have a really high health status, where if an animal leaves, it can't come home, it doesn't have to leave. Um, they can be isolated on farm. They have to test negative for mucilosis, TB, and medivisna. And once those tests are back, if they're negative, um, as long as they stay in the isolation, they can be collected whenever, however many times. And the semen, you can do whatever the, you want with the semen within the borders of Canada. It can be sold, given away, bred to the neighbor. Um, so there's, compared to the way it works now for export, um, the animal, there's way less cost involved. Um, even if they came to us to be collected, because actually from a business standpoint, running around to every farm collecting one ram here and there for me doesn't make economic sense, but they could test at home, come to our center, get trained, get collected, put semen in the tank and go home probably in a two week window. Whereas now with the export program before you were two months before you even made it into the collection barn and a bunch of testing, um, but they could stand on farms. And so fresh semen could be an option. Frozen semen certainly is. So for those people looking at biosecurity, um, and I think, you know, fresh semen with cervical AI and sheep is reasonable. You can get reasonable success, but even frozen semen can be, become quite a bit more available. And I think more cost-effective because the person who owns the ram 
doesn't have thousands and thousands of dollars into quarantine and everything before they even get semen in the tank. So it's been approved. We will offer it this fall here in Alberta because we're here. Um, and by next season, we're hoping that there will be a team, because I don't know if they'll, they'll be probably mobile, will be team in Atlantic Canada. There'll be a center in Ontario to serve Ontario. And then I have a lady in BC um, who's interested in doing it out there. So hopefully that means that for some people worried about biosecurity, access to fairly cost-effective semen and potentially fresh semen that you could use cervically and you know, potentially learn to do some of your own AI or have technicians do it um, will help make it more economically feasible. Um, the question about why, where does one learn? Um, laparoscopic AI with frozen semen is limited to veterinarians um, because it's considered surgery. Um, but the cervical AI, I think if we start to get enough interest, um, we'll probably just run courses for producers to be able to learn to do it. And we can ship fresh, cheap semen around the same way they do with stallions. There's special containers that keep it at four degrees. I fought for this for 15 years. I was very happy when they finally approved it. That's great news, Lynn. Thank you for sharing that. And they'll do one more call as we are past time, if there's any last questions that are coming through. Give it another 30 seconds or so, just in case someone's typing, thinking of a question. If anybody wants information on the domestic program, they should email me. Lynn, I know you gave your email already at um, at the first break, but would you mind maybe giving it again just in case some people had stepped away when you had given that? Yeah. So it's lynn at ocflock.com, and I have typed it in so that people can see it. Perfect. Thank you. So yeah, if they want more information on the domestic program, um, they can email me. Like I say, this year will be a little bit limited just because we only found out in June. But by next year, we should be able to offer it across the country. Perfect. All right. Well, I don't see any other questions coming through um, the chat box. So uh, with that, Lynn, I would like to thank you very much um, for presenting tonight and to all of our participants who joined us. Uh, this will conclude the webinar. I will be sending an email to everyone who registered for this evening session that will include a link to where you can access the webinar recording. So thank you very much. No problem. And if anybody wants a scrotal 